So I'm here with Rabbi Dr. Zvi Blanchard, who is a uh, professor of philosophy and of law, uh, currently teaching in, in, uh, at a university in Germany, and has a very illustrious career as a Torah educator, Torah scholar, uh, taught at the rabbinical school that I went to, and um, has been involved in just a whole host of issues through scholarship and in community leadership. The, the opportunity today is to speak a little bit about... Um, in your younger years, you were very involved in the, in the civil rights movement. Uh -huh. And um, I wonder what it meant to you as a religious Jew to be involved in such matters. Well, I mean, a large portion of the, of the motivation to get involved in um, the civil rights movement came from religious commitments, especially the religious commitment to, I guess, the advance, supposed to be the advancement of all people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I started as a teenager, to be honest with you, uh, um, picketing Woolworths because they had separate lunch counters. Mm. And it seemed to me to be such a violation of the notion of human dignity that I saw in the opening story of, 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 of uh, Genesis. And so against what I've been taught by my own teachers. So it, the Civil Rights Movement was a continuation of the notion that human beings have a certain innate dignity and worth and must be treated that way. And the long history of American slavery and the way in which, um, then we said blacks, and I guess we'd say African Americans, mm -hmm. were being treated, it seemed such a violation of, of that view of things that I got involved. So I guess for me, religiously, it meant a way to express in wider world the deep religious values that I was, I was, that I was taught and that I held. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Uh, so I know you went, you went down to Selma to march. I wonder. What was that experience like for you? What was the environment like being there? Um, there are two parts to the there are two parts to the Selma story. Mm -hmm. One part is the uh, the experience in Selma itself, and one part is the trip there. Uh -huh. um, we we started out in Birmingham, and then we're divided into two groups. One stayed in Birmingham, and those that stayed in Birmingham really actually got hurt. Um, the, the half, my half, got sent to Selma. It was a, a strange experience because the area was ringed. You couldn't just go in. Um, but the residents and people doing the organizing, the African Americans doing the organizing, they told us where to go and they brought us in. The amazing thing was, the first question they said is, you'll probably need kosher food. I said, yes. So they started thinking, we're, we're, getting, we're rounding up who will be bringing it in for you. Wow. You want to know what time the minion is? I uh -huh. said, I was flabbergasted. I said, yes. It was, when I, mean, I actually write, it was a huge community of human beings from all different kinds of mm -hmm. backgrounds, but also a huge community of Jews from all different kinds of backgrounds. And it was, um, in some sense, I mean, it was the first time I saw actually Orthodox rabbis. I wasn't a rabbi then. Orthodox rabbis present and strongly in favor of this. Um, and everybody identified as a Jew who was there, who was Jewish and who was a rabbi or was Jewish and out. They just, all of a sudden, keep, people were putting their keep on. It became a matter of, I guess, of pride to say, we're here and we stand for these kinds of things. But what struck me most about being there was the, was the kindness of the, both the movement people especially the black movement people, how kind kind and considerate they were in that sense. It was a moment when everybody's fate seemed linked together, and that was a, that was a great possibility. It's also that I uh, did a lot of demonstrating in my youth. Somehow or other, I never really got close to being hurt, except that one time. On the march itself, I was walking between two little black girls holding hands, and a state trooper lost control of himself and started to beat me with a club. That's the closest I've ever said. Wow. Um, other than that, I've had a charmed life. I wouldn't complete, but I remember thinking to myself that that um, oh, the whole it was one of these whole world is watching moments. When you mm -hmm. thought to yourself, "This is going, this is going to make it," and I'm I'm just blessed to be here. All of us, not just the big names like Abraham Joshua Heschel, mm -hmm. okay, but all of those little small guys like me. I was there because I was a co I was a college undergraduate and a TA in statistics, and my professor said, "If you want to go to Selma, I'll grade the papers and you can go." Wow! So it was it was a it was a moment I think of a genuine consensus, an important consensus on a, a major national value. So, Amazing, you know. I, I we hear a lot about the reform and conservative Jews who were present there. 
but we don't hear a lot about orthodoxy. So uh, it was a strong uh, orthodox president. In fact, very interesting. Um, people forget Glenn Richter, an orthodox Jew, was uh, on the SNCC's coordinating council. Is that right? Yeah. It's very interesting. So, you know, most famously, you, you you mentioned Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. The picture of him marching with MLK is so popular. Right. But we know, as you just shared, that so many different types of Jews were involved. Correct. What do you think it was in particular that drew the Jewish community out to this? I mean, why were, why were Jews so, I don't want to say disproportionately, but so heavily invested in this? I think for two, two reasons. Mm -hmm. I'm not a specialist in this, but I uh -huh. think two were obvious at the time. One, and the first one was this... This was an inherited Jewish value in many people's minds. Mm -hmm. Whatever their religious belief structure was, they believed that being Jewish and Judaism taught this, this notion of, of human equality and, and of fa fairness, simple fairness and decency mm -hmm. in relationships. Secondly, Jews had long experience with being on the other end of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the other end of, of, of mm -hmm. maltreatment. We didn't get, of course, what African Americans got. Nobody dragged us in chains here. Right. But the bottom line was, we were sympathetic to groups who were seen as, I don't want to eat in the same place as you, I don't want to drink from the same fountains as you, I don't want to send, go to the same school. Mm -hmm. we had, most of us had seen some of them. My grandparents certainly had seen it. So people inherited a sense that, that we identify. And also, of course, to be Jewish for a long time, even and to this day, whatever social class, Jews, whether they used to say, Jews, you know, always identify with the underdog somehow mm -hmm. or other. So there was a certain sense in which this was identifying with the underdog, but also identifying with a with a liberation moment m movement. And we were glad to have been liberated from the, the misery we'd been in before, so we identified with that too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, looking at today, how how do you think religious Jews can take their Jewish values, their Torah, and use that to help improve society, to help to contribute to the advancement of all peoples, to help to contribute to the sense that every human being has infinite value. How do, what does that process look like? If someone's just been learning Torah their whole life, or they're engaged religiously at their synagogue, but they say, I want to go out there, how do they bring their Jewish values and their Torah to the public sphere? I mean, it's a good question, because in areas like the development of, of civil rights, people from the group themselves really are the people that are in charge. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, 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 that's not an area where... On the other hand, there are, I mean, there are Jews like Bob Kaplan in New York, who's an expert at using political power, knows how, and makes alliances between the Jewish community and minority communities in the New York area, and says, I'm going to show you how to use this power, and then you do what you want with it. Mm -hmm. So there is a way of, of losing, using practical knowledge um, that Jews have gained as a sort of successful minority group. Again, um, you have to be very careful to understand that the real decisions are made by the members of the group, the other groups. Even right. if, you know, it, otherwise it gets gets messy and isn't helpful at all. But if I, what I would say is that um, what Jews need to do is to locate classes of individuals who are at risk, who are who are in some way or other um, not noticed. Um, we did a consult hmm. once, a community development consult, a number of years ago. We found 27 categories of Jews who wanted to make sure took part of the, took part in the in the community change process. We made sure that those that those categories included Jews on welfare, single mothers, single Jews mothers on welfare. Okay, there there, there are Jews across the spectrum too, and they need to be located. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you got to locate those people in the wider society. The trick is. In some sense, Judaism, certainly Jewish law, is about protecting the vulnerable. And that's, that means that, that the image of God in all of us needs to be respected, but in a concrete way. Mm -hmm. Not just, hey, you're terrific, you're made mm -hmm. in the image of God, but your needs, your concerns, your risks, your vulnerabilities are my, my business to I want to help in some way or other. And there are lots of there are plenty of Jews who fall into that category and need to be helped in that way. And they put it, in the wider world, there are huge numbers of people in America. Yeah, that need yeah. To. and that's a religious commitment. That's not some societal or citizenship commitment. It comes. Uh, it seems like what I hear you saying is that this is a part of what it means to be a Torah Jew in a sense. Correct. Yeah. I mean, if you hear the good voice of God telling you, "Listen, remain. Listen to. Do not oppress the stranger." You were with, you know, widows and orphans. Don't don't oppress a stranger. You were strangers in the land of Egypt. It's God who says mm -hmm, that to mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. Realize you have to pay attention to where oppression is and redress it. Yeah. Some way or other. So so going beyond just religious Judaism, and I, I guess my last question today, what what advice would you give to young activists, um, Jewish or Gentile, religious or secular, 
who are trying to make their mark on the world, trying to create change to support vulnerable populations. What type of general advice would you give to uh, to those to trying to make a difference today? I don't know if I'm a person to give that kind uh -huh, of general uh -huh, advice. Uh -huh. Young activists probably know more, more what they need to do <laughs> than I need to do. And I would say my first piece of advice is pay attention to what you know to be true. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Go from what you know to what you don't know. Mm. Um, you got into you got into this business because you saw things, yeah. And pay attention to that. And second, I think, and this is a hard one, a much harder one. Um, figure out where your integrity lies, because there are so right now there are so many serious concerns. We are in the middle of an environmental crisis, okay, worldwide environmental crisis in some sense. Maybe not. I would call it a crisis. Most scientists call it a crisis. You don't want to cope with a serious issue. A lot of activists are involved in that. That puts many of us. There are, we're in the same. We also have, I mean, ec economic disparities that are growing economic mm -hmm. disparities that have to be addressed. Okay, exactly how activists plan to do this is not my business to tell them. I'm not some wise old sage on stage who knows what to do. In fact, the truth is, I take my cue from younger people who say, "Listen, we've been investigating. This is where we think we should need to go." Once you know where you need to go, stick to the integrity that brought you there. Okay, the temptation to end up in deal making mm -hmm. is enormous, especially for leadership. Mm -hmm. And there are a hundred good reasons why you should make those deals. But my own sense is that you will be sorry long term if you make them. You're much better saying to yourself, this is what I really believe in, and I'm going to focus on that, and I'm going to see to it that the areas that I'm actively concerned with changing, I just keep my attention fixed on that and continue to do that. Um, again, that's easy for me to say. I'm not, you know, I'm not 25 years old working as an activist. But the people that I meet who are impress me that they've decided this is the values where I'm at. I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to continue to work in this society to make them real. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me where that's been done, I said both in the environment and to a greater extent around immigration and naturalization issues, there's been success. Again, not why no one's we're not revolutionary success, but success. And that's what people, I think, yeah. you know, I would say, you know what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, one of the reasons you've been such an important teacher for me is not only because you're so deeply invested in Torah, not only in the learning, but in the living, not only deeply invested in, in philosophy and psychology, but also that you have such a commitment and a track record for caring about social justice, caring about the oppressed and the and the alienated, and uh, continue to be a voice that, that to be a religious Jew means to invest our energies in those. And so I want to thank you for that continued inspiration, and I hope others get that inspiration today uh, to be able to learn from that as well. Thank you so much for your pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs>